Okay, so my name is Cara. I'm currently 34 and I'm a primary school teacher. Um, I live in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and in my free time, I like to go running and I like to go to the gym and socialise and I like to spend my spare time with family and just really love being around people. And yeah, that's probably a little summary of me. So it all kind of started, I would say, the November, December of 2022. Um, I was getting lots of um, like lower abdominal pain, lower back pain and excessive bloating. So I had gone back and forth to the GP and they had suggested that I had irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and they said that that's something that could be triggered by stress. Um, and at the time, it just so happened, life was a little bit stressful, work was a little bit stressful. Um, so it, it made sense. I didn't question it. And unfortunately, at the time, I didn't know the symptoms of cervical cancer. And that's probably one of my regrets. I just had no awareness. So I didn't question the GP and I certainly didn't challenge it. I just tried to reduce certain foods out of my diet that could be triggering and I did so much research about what that meant for like my gut health and I really went down the line of I have IBS and how can I manage this um, just because the symptoms were getting super progressively worse to the point that I was taking time off work I had a hot water bottle strapped to me most of the time I spent an obscene amount of time in the bath just because it took the pressure away it took the pain away um, eventually I had to take, take painkillers, um, not strong painkillers, just paracetamols. Um, and I was unable to really go on any kind of car journey that was any longer than 15, 20 minutes because of the discomfort. And that just went from being a little bit painful or just like a little bit sore. And then it became more severe and a lot more frequent. It was almost every day. Um, and it just so happened that I was due my smear test in the January of 2023. Um, at that appointment, when the nurse did the, the scraping of the cervix, she said, oh, there was a little bit of a bleed there. And she asked me lots of questions. Um, and she said, look, I'm just a one man band. It's just myself that works here. So for my peace of mind, I would really like to have a second opinion. And I would like to book you back in for a GP that specialises in female health. Um, and I said, yeah, no problem at all. So about a month later, I went back to the GP and it was, again, this lady who was fantastic and she has a special interest in female health. And she said, look, I, I think I can see a little bit of a discolouring at the neck of your cervix. She said, at the moment, I'm not overly concerned, but I think it would be a really good idea to get you referred to the colposcopy clinic in the hospital. And she said, have you had your smear results back yet? And I said, no, funny you should say that. I did phone to chase them up, but there was a bit of a delay. So I think usually in the UK, it's about six to eight week wait. Unfortunately, it was closer to about 16 weeks at the time. Now, I'm not sure what that was because of. I'm not sure if it was just a backlog or the time of year. But anyway, there was a delay. And so she decided to get the ball rolling anyway and have me referred to the hospital so it was kind of at that point we started to think oh, okay this could be a little bit more at, at this point I genuinely still did not make the link now I should have and if I knew the symptoms and I was more aware myself then I would have absolutely made the link but I thought I had two parallel things going on here an abnormal smear and IBS so two completely different things and I didn't make the link um, and I just wish I had now. But anyway, we went to the colposcopy clinic. She just had a little look at the kind of health of my cervix and had a look around. And she said, yeah, I can see the discolouring that we're talking about. And actually, I think they might just be high risk cells. She said, fairly common. What we do is we remove these cells. And depending on how severe they are, there's slightly different ways of doing that. So I was a bit nervous, naturally. Um, and it just so happened that afternoon when I got home, my smear results had come back to say, yes, there are high risk cells being detected and we need to get them removed. But I was already in the process. Um, so I'm ne needle phobic. So I'm absolutely petrified of needles and anything related to hospital. Until this point, I have only ever really been to the doctor for like, like eczema, you know, just the usual things, nothing serious. Um, so yeah, I, I opted to be put to sleep for the procedure. They gave you lots of information about how it was carried out. And I just, the thought of them 
burning cells from the cervix awake it didn't fill me with joy and it just it just filled me with, with quite stress I suppose it's, it's quite an undignified thing anyway I'm the thought of sitting in the chair and your legs you know like the gynae chair and I don't know I think I've always just been so private I'm not one to like flaunt my body or anything so to have someone there between your legs it's just really tricky um and I understand there's I, I needed to do it um but yeah, I opted to be put to sleep. And I just thought if I go to sleep, then I don't know what they're doing. And they see this every day, but I don't need to be worried about anything other than just going in and getting it done. It was my first experience of having an abnormal smear or having to do anything about about it. So again, it was all foreign land for me. And to be honest, I, I suppose that in itself, I think that needs to change because Going to a colposcopy clinic and going to a gynae clinic is is normal to a certain extent. This place is meant to make you better and they have such a specialised service that actually I think if more women really knew about their cervix health or in fact their whole gynae health and we knew the symptoms for the different gynae issues that happen and we know the places to go for help, I really do think that would make all the difference to all women. Um, in this country, it's it's something embarrassing to talk about and it's there's like stigma related to talking about your gynae health and people tend not to do it without like a beetroot red face and get embarrassed and want to skip across the subject and I get it I was that person I probably didn't go for my sne smear as quickly as I should have because I was so embarrassed I was so ashamed of my body and looking back now in hindsight that's ridiculous but at the time that's just truly how I felt and I think lots more can be done in schools and youth clubs and at home with your friends if we talk about these things it just normalizes them women have vaginas that is that is what we're built with we have cervix these words are not swear words and I think we shouldn't be embarrassed to say the word because if we're embarrassed to say the word we're going to be embarrassed to seek help when something down there goes wrong whether it be a discharge or something that changes and I just think we will empower ourselves if we talk about these things openly, burn down all of the stigmas, because it's so important that we look after our female health. And the same goes for men, but I know we're talking about cervical cancer. So yeah, it's just a lot needs to change. So the next conversation, I was put to sleep for my procedure. I was then awoken from the procedure and I thought, oh, I got myself dressed and had some water and something to eat, which is the kind of, you have to tick those boxes before you're allowed to leave the hospital. Um, and I thought, oh, I don't even feel sore down there or tender. And the the consultant came in. So the lady that spoke to me prior to the appointment, um, she kind of came in just to say hello and everything. And I'm going to be carrying out the procedure today. This is what we're going to do. Do you have questions? So the same lady, um, the same consultant came back in after the procedure. And she just said, oh, can I can we go somewhere more private? And so I just burst into tears because I knew, I thought, oh my goodness, we're on a shared ward. I think there was maybe six other ladies. And I thought, this isn't good if she wants a private chat. And she said, listen, we could do it here if you'd prefer, but I think it would be better to be private. And she kind of knelt down in front of me and put her hand on my knee. And I thought, oh, this is terrible. And she just said, look, I've gone in to remove the cells. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that today. She said, I think we've gone a little bit beyond cell removal. So I was like, oh, what, what does that mean? Do I have cancer? Am I going to die? Am I going to lose all my hair? And I, I remember the sequence. And I don't really remember what she said after that. Everything just kind of went silent in terms of my brain was rushing so much I wasn't able to really process what else was happening in the room I do remember her saying Cara I'm so sorry but I can't answer those questions right now because we really don't know what we're dealing with she said what I have been able to do is take biopsies we're going to send them away to lab the labs and they will give us those answers and she said I'll just leave you for a moment with your family and I was like whew so at that point, I didn't really know how serious it was in terms of, I didn't know if I had a diagnosis or not. I didn't know how unwell I was or not. 
And unfortunately, the, the consultant just wasn't able to answer my questions. And I completely understand why she wasn't expecting that situation either. But that day we left the hospital and naturally, I think my brain went to the worst place that I am. Um, I'm probably going to get quite a serious diagnosis here. And, and, and I think for me, again, naivety, cancer told me I'm going to die and there might not be anything they can do for me. And I, yeah, I suppose my experience of cancer is in much older people and usually the result is that they do pass on. And I suppose I'm very lucky that I don't know lots of people who have experienced a cancer diagnosis. Now, I know that there's lots of cancers and there's lots of treatment and there is so much hope and success with those treatments that, that the end result isn't always dying. But I think I wish I knew that at the time. I think I was just looking for a bit of reassurance. But I also understand she can't give me reassurance in case actually what she was saying wasn't right, if that makes sense. Um, so I think from there, I lived in a bit of a haze for a few days. Um, the gynae team at the hospital contacted me and said, look, the I would like you to come in. He said, this is what I specialise, gynae cancer. He said, so he was able to answer all my questions. And he said, look, right now we don't have your diagnosis because the... The, the biopsies that were taken, they were, there's not enough tissue there. So I'm going to do the same procedure again. He said, but this is my bag. This is what I do. This is what I specialize in. So I want you to come in tomorrow morning and we're going to squeeze you in as an emergency case. Um, and so he did. He took the biopsies. But at that point, he was able to reassure me to the point that he was able to answer all the questions. What happens if this happens? What happens if it is a cancer? What happens? And he got gave me lots of different scenarios and what would happen in each of those. So even that, I was like, oh, okay, this might not be the end. <laughs> so after that, when he took the biopsies, he also at that point referred me for an MRI. He said, let's just get this ball rolling. Um, so he took the biopsies and I think about around about a week later, he phoned. And it was the day of my MRI. So in the morning, I went in for my MRI. And in the afternoon, he phoned and he said, look, Cara, I just wanted to let you know the labs are back and cancer has been detected. He said, at this time, this time we're not able to give you your staging until we get all your scans. So at that point, we were then started to talk about fertility. He said, are you a parent? And I said, no, at the moment, I'm not. And he said, OK, well, I really need you to be thinking about do you want to be a parent? And I said, well, absolutely. Although children are not or have not been in my imminent plan or mine and my partner's imminent plan, they were definitely always the plan for the future. I think you always just assume that you're going to have babies and have a family. And we, me and my partner have been together a long time. And yeah, so at that point, he also then referred me to a fertility clinic in Aberdeen. So it's about 100 miles away from my hometown. Um, and yeah, so that process started too. So shortly after, the, the scans all came back to say that I was... They, there was also, sorry, a question mark around my lymph nodes from the MRI. They were slightly swollen. So they were curious as to whether they were just swollen because they were trying to fight what was going on down there. Or was was there cancer involved in the lymph nodes? So I was then sent for further scans. Thankfully, the lymph nodes were not infected. They were just swollen. They were just inflamed. Um, and the, the cancer was contained to the neck of my cervix, which was, they called a large tumour. I believe it was somewhere between three and four centimetres. Um, and it had gone slightly into the surrounding tissues. So that it impacted like the neck of my womb as well as my cervix. So I, I think that made me stage 2C, I think. Um, I think I would have been stage 3 if the lymph nodes were involved, but thankfully they weren't. So it was decided that I would have six chemotherapies. So I started them on the 6th of July. So every Thursday... For six weeks, I had chemotherapy on a Thursday. Um, and running alongside that, Monday to Friday, I'd go in for radiotherapy each day for 25 sessions. So that took me, I think it was five, it was six weeks, so 25 sessions of radio and six chemos. Um, so on a Thursday morning, for example, I was going to my radiotherapy. 
usually, I mean, when you're on the bed doing the actual radiotherapy, it doesn't take very long. Um, you're maybe on the bed for about 10 minutes. So it's like kind of like high doses of radiation targeted at your pelvis or to the tumour area. Um, but on a Thursday, I had just enough time for a wee cup of tea and then I was straight into chemo. And I was there probably most days till about five, four or five. So it was a really long exhausting day on a Thursday every other day was just radiotherapy and it was just in you were probably in for I had to drink a certain amount of water and then wait for my bladder to fill and then I would go onto the bed and they would do the treatment from there um so surreal actually thinking about it it doesn't feel like I did it but I did um so that was the six weeks and then I think I had about a week off and then I came back down to Aberdeen and did what's called brachytherapy. So that's direct treatment to the cervix. So like an applicator is inserted into the vagina and, and connects to your cervix and targeted radio pellets run up and run up and through this machine. So I did that over three days, but it's a proper procedure to get the apparatus kind of inserted and it stays there for the three days and you basically just kind of lie flat on this bed and try and not move because you really don't want it to be moving inside of you because it's all programmed so perfectly that the radio radioactive pellets hit just at the right spot, at just at the right time. It's all, I mean, it's incredible equipment. It's an incredible way of doing things. I Apparently, it's one of the oldest, oldest methods of radioactive treatment and they still use it today. Um... I'm not going to lie, that was quite horrific. I, I, I think it's the invasiveness of it. Um, I mean, dignity all gone. <laughs> As you're being wheeled around a hospital with a catheter hanging out and this apparatus kind of inside you. Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't pleasant, but that was a really important part of the treatment. So I think what the, the consultant had said was, look, this this treatment, what was it? This treatment is going to give you another 50% of the amount of radiation you've already had. So I had a certain amount over five weeks, the 25 sessions. This is going to give you 50% of that again, targeted over three separate sessions. Again, my mind was blown. Never heard of brachytherapy before in my life. Um, Because I did consider declining that part of treatment when I read about it I just I thought I just don't know if I can do this I, I struggled to get a smear test never mind having this procedure done and I just felt it, it just felt so invasive and it just felt so undignified and I was just mortified thinking about it but I decided that it was really important that I, I did it and I had to do everything I possibly could to make sure that my outcomes were positive and that I'm going to hopefully live a long and happy life. And I just had to get over myself at that point and decide, you know what, this is this could be life or death, Cara. Get a grip. Just go in, get it done. And hopefully you never have to do anything like that again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the chemo definitely made me tired, um, like super tired. Um, I was very lucky, though. I know that lots of chemos make you lose your hair. I was very fortunate that that wasn't the case for me. Um, my symptoms were really nosebleeds, um, lots of shivering, um, headaches, and f just fatigue like you wouldn't believe. Um, you can always, so when the chemo goes in, it can, goes in through your hand, or for me, it was in through my hand through a cannula. And it's so cold, you can feel it travel up your arm. It's the weirdest sensation. Um, but the, the nurses, I mean, I have a whole different level of respect for what these nurses do on the daily. And they were so happy and chirpy and they just lifted you up and they they literally don't stop. They are in and it's constant person, person, person. My chemo, for some reason, it took quite a long time to go into your body, my body, whereas lots of other people were kind of in and out, in and out. So I seen most of the people come and go throughout the day. Um, I was probably there one of the longest. I'm not sure why that was. Different chemos, different cancers, different treatments, I suppose. Um, but yeah, everyone was just so lovely. And considering it's a, a cancer treatment, you would expect it to be quite a sad place, but it actually wasn't. They were all just so lovely and really supportive. And yeah, it was a surreal experience. 
that you're going to get through it, that I was going to get through it. I was so scared. I think, I think because it can be really brutal, everybody warns you about how brutal it's going to be. But it's just a case of showing up and taking each session as it comes. And everybody is going to be different and everybody's body is going to react different. I think I just put so much pressure on myself and I was so petrified of losing my hair and I was so petrified of the side effects. I wish I was more accepting that what will be will be. If I lose my hair, I lose my hair. And I just wish I didn't spend so much time dwelling on those things. And actually some of them didn't even happen. So it just feels like such a waste of energy. So after brachytherapy, um, I knew I was going to have to like physically recover. I was very sore, lots of medication. So I, my head was quite hazy for, for a few days until I kind of got home and slept for a start. Um, and then after that, it was very quick that menopause started to hit me. Um, I actually thought it was treatment. I thought I was getting really hot and then like hot flushes and I, my body was getting really hot and sweaty I could almost feel like a heat rise through my body I could almost tell you exactly where it was and it would like rise up my back and it would feel quite prickly I was so low and the headaches and my skin was so itchy it was crawling oh my goodness some of the side effects were just horrendous um and so I went to my GP I contacted the hospital and they said look speak to your GP this sounds a little bit like menopause which is likely with the treatment that you've had so I went to the doctor and, and true enough, it was um, premature ovarian insufficiency. So my ovaries were now no longer producing eggs at the way that they, the way that they would have or should have as a result of treatment. So they were just so damaged. And so over time, I think my ability, my, sorry, my ovaries ability to produce estrogen will, will fluctuate and slowly decline to when it just won't anymore so very quickly because my GP was amazing and she really knew her stuff she spoke me through all the options and she said look I do think that hormone replacement therapy is a good idea for you she said the way I look at it is that your body is no longer producing so your body is losing its estrogen production all we're doing is topping up that bucket we're just giving you what your body would have been making itself so we're just replacing what your body's losing and so she sent me away to have like a real think about it. And I did a bit of my own research. And when I realised, again, I wish I knew all of this, um, when I realised what oestrogen does for your body in terms of your cardiovascular health, your brain health, your eyes, everything, your, your female organs. And it just petrified me to think that my body wouldn't have oestrogen. And my consultant said I was OK to have hormone replacement. Um, so, yeah, I went for it. And I have to say it's made a huge difference to my mood to all the other side effects. Um, but it is definitely still a daily struggle in terms of the symptoms just come from nowhere. Some days I feel like a little kangaroo and I'm ready to take on the world. And other days I just really can't. My energy levels are really low, lots of fatigue, again, headaches. My eyesight's a little bit duller than it was before, aches and pains. Oh, I mean, the list really does go on. I won't bore you with all that, but it, I mean, it does. It has such an impact on your body. Um, and and we, I was lucky that my GP was fantastic. Um, but I know not everybody has the same experience. Um, lots of GPs are not. Yeah, so I was scanned in December, um, on the 18th of December. And just at the start of the new year, I had a call from the consultant to say that the scan was 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 good and not so good. So in, in good, the, the tumour is now mostly gone and lots of the surrounding tissues that were showing as cancerous are now showing as scar tissue, which is what they would expect. However, there is still this kind of cluster of cells. I'm just going to close that over, sorry. Um, there is still a cluster of cells that is visible. And at the moment, they're just going to kind of monitor me because it's unfortunately the scan is not completely clear, is what I'm trying to say in a long way. Um, so what they're going to do is from December to April is four months. So they're going to leave me that four months and I'm going to be scanned on the 23rd of April. And I suppose I'm just praying that that scan is then just completely clear and hopefully I can just move on. Um, and yeah, that's all I'm praying for. I suppose if you've had a diagnosis, um, you've absolutely got this. I've had lots of people say, oh, I don't know how you've done it. You do it because you have to, you don't have a choice, but I can promise you that you are going to absolutely surprise yourself with your resilience and your strength 
And I mean, that won't be every day. There will be days where there are lots of tears and you lose hope, but you can do it and you will do it 100%. So I think we need to educate ourselves on female health. We need to educate our daughters and our sisters and our aunties and our nieces. And we need to talk about it. There is no shame in having a vagina or a cervix or going for these health appointments. They're so important. We go to the dentist for our teeth. We just need to go to the doctor or the GP for our smears. It's so important. Please keep on top of all your health issues. Any changes, report them. Get to know your, get to know the symptoms. There are five gynae cancers and there are symptoms linked to each. If you know them, you know what you're looking for and you can detect a change. I was silly that I didn't know, so it took longer. Um, and don't get me wrong, those symptoms can be other things, but if you go to a GP, they can really look into it for you. We need to be empowered by our knowledge and by our actions, and hopefully bigger change will come government-wide and like education in schools and youth clubs and anywhere else that we go. 